Hello and welcome to the History Tea Podcast, the podcast with lots of history and, of course, lots of tea. Hey, David. Hey, Ali. You all right? Yeah, I'm all right. I'm all right. Are you all right? You know, surviving. Well, that's not great. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you okay, hun? Are we going to have to turn this into a therapy session and not a podcast? So it all happened. It all started when I was three. And uh, <laughs> my cat abused me. Oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> not the cat. To be fair, my only memory of my cat that I had as a child was it stood in front of me, threw up an elastic band on my lap, and then left. Apparently, it used to attack me all the time. That's why we gave I it to the neighbours. I brought neighbors. you a gift. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, apparently that's why, because when we moved houses, I always wondered why did we not bring the cat, and it's because he used to attack me as a baby. Shit. <laughs> yeah, and uh, so the neighbours took him. A baby attacking cat. Yeah. What are they planning? I don't know. <laughs> it's terrifying to think. Yeah, Marvin, if you're yeah. still out there, it's not too late to come clean. Yeah, we'll, we'll take him in. Uh, okay. <laughs> You'll be treated with respect, Marvin, but you've got to come clean. Marvin with the cat. <laughs> so, speaking about killers, we are going to do... Arguably one of the best killers on the planet. What, the cats? No, what the podcast episode. Oh, yes, about. yes. So the podcast episode is going to be about cats. I mean, sorry. It's going to be about firearms. It's going to be about guns. Guns! Boom, booms. My boomstick. Quote, <laughs> Ash from The Walking... Not The Walking Dead, The Evil Dead. Evil Dead, part three. This is my boomstick. <laughs> I love that film. It's, it's so batshit crazy. It's a great film. It's a great... Did you watch the TV series? Of course I did. It's so good. Are they cancelled Yeah, it? I can't believe they cancelled it. Bring it back. By popular demand. He was also, Ash was at the end of the remake of The Evil Dead. I didn't see that. So the newer film was actually pretty good. Mm. I think it was like 2013, 2014, something like that. Um, but after the end credits scene, you know, they copied Marvel a little bit. I feel like that was a trend. Um, at the end, Ash just turns to the camera and he uh, he just smiles and then it, it ends. Brilliant. Yeah. He was also in all three Spider Man. He movies. was because it was Sam Raimi. Who did yeah. It. And he's suspected to be Mysterio in all of those. Right, but then obviously he plays different. That didn't happen. Well, it's what it's. Jake Gyllenhaal came in, smashed it. Yeah. Well, I think like obviously it was different. It was a different different universe. Universe, but who knows. They're doing a Spider-Verse thing, aren't they, possibly? Well, I think they're going to try and do... Because of the Spider-Verse, that's the same universe. It's implied that it's the same universe as Sam Raimi's. Yeah. Um, the thing is, though, now they've done time travel and they've done the weird, like, multi-dimension, multi-dimensional thing, they can do whatever the fuck Whatever they, they want. want. They've pretty much opened it up to, we can do whatever we want. You can't say shit about it anymore. So I think we're it's about... Like the, um, Morpheus film that's come out. Yes, with the and... Batman. The, well, not the Batman and not the Man Bat. The Vampire Man. Yeah. Yes. So, um, what's his name from the first Spider Man of the new one with Tom Holland in it? Vulture. Yes. He appears in the trailer. Right. So, and obviously Venom's going to be a kind of, but then they reference the um, Andrew Garfield. Spider-Man in that one. Oh, so I don't Lord. know what they're going to do. I don't know what's going on either. Let's talk about something I do know about. Because we are only, <laughs> what, five minutes Welcome in? Welcome to and, our new podcast. And, and Spider-Man. <laughs> what's going on? Film OT. Film OT. <laughs> Spider tea. Oh, that sounds like the worst drink. Spider tea. Mm, I, so, bet, I bet there is a spider tea. I bet there is some sort of like... Infused, infused... silk, spider silk yeah. or some bullshit. It's meant to be good for your glutes. <laughs> <laughs> okay. 
<laughs> I don't know. Yeah, well, yeah. That's... I just named a random body part. I don't know what that bit is. Really good for your sixth sense. It's really good for helping you climb walls. <laughs> Ever wanted to climb walls? <laughs> Spider tea. <laughs> okay, we've done it again. We've gone off topic again. Back to topics. Boomsticks. Guns. Boomsticks. We're going to look at the history of guns. And like, it's going to be a brief overview of guns and the just general development over the years. Why they developed, when they developed, what's changed. Because, you know, it's a big scary world out there, but guns are a big part of it now. And there's a big history behind it. Like, like And a lot of technological innovation, which, you know, arguably could have been put to like better use, such as like curing cancer or solving world hunger. But uh, no, yeah, but most medical devices are made from. You could, if you were a bastard, from military, make an argument that guns have helped save lives <laughs> because they've allowed us to study people that have died from guns and gave us insight into the human body. And you wouldn't be entirely wrong, but I think as well you wouldn't be entirely right. Yeah, I catch twenty two, man. <laughs> you know. Sometimes we have to kill thousands of people. <laughs> no, we don't. To cure cancer. <laughs> no, we don't. <laughs> we don't, Ali. We do not need to Some, do that. You know, please, please, for the love of God, for the sometimes listeners. Sometimes I think we don't need gun reforms. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like gun reform, you know, if I don't have a gun to protect myself, then someone else is going to have a gun. So, you know, I think... It's just one of those, David. I think you know you just gotta you just gotta be open to the fact that guns are great. Now I know you're joking because <laughs> I've known you for many years, but our listeners might not. <laughs> so I cannot wait for them to all come at you. <laughs> yeah, we thing is right. We're not gonna go along, along the politics route of, of guns. guns for no, this, this it's just gonna episode. be pretty. We're, we're we're from the UK. We all have, I think, sh- similar shared. Um, attitudes and attitudes of what we believe gun control and gun law should be. We definitely have a strong opinion that ours is the right one, <laughs> mainly because you know lots of people aren't dying in mass shootings every year. But we, you know, we won't get into that one. We'll just Ali, you on. said we're not going to get into the politics, yeah, you know, and yeah, then okay. you've just got into the politics. Yeah, no, all right, okay. We're, we're not a political that. podcast. No. We are a history-based podcast. A very, yeah. We're... Well, yeah. <laughs> Accurate, we are. I feel... Like a gun. <laughs> yeah. Well, so, not some of the early ones. Well, no, that's very true. We touched on it briefly in our dueling episode. We did. But do you know what? What's really interesting is talking about briefly the idea of guns saving lives kind of segues. It doesn't, by the way, but kind of, well, kind of, ah, anyway, no politics, but it kind of segues into the beginning of guns. All right. So, where are we? We're in China. It's 13th century. I've heard of this place. It's a big place. It's very important, right? And somewhere in China... They're still making iPhones. They're st- they were the making iPhone iPhones. One. The iPhone 1. They were developing it from the get-go. Apple stole the idea from ancient texts long since buried in tombs of kings and emperors. But <laughs> the, there's somewhere in China, there's someone working on something. Do you know what it is? I assume it's gunpowder. Wrong. Fuck. It is the elixir of life. And in this process, <laughs> they make <Well>. gunpowder. <laughs> <laughs> it must be the most ironic fucking thing to ever have happened in the history of inventions. They like, genuinely, that was the pursuit of, of, of the intention of this stuff was to do that. And then they found out, actually, this stuff blows up real good. And more <laughs> yeah but the way i see gunpowder is is a black sand like material yes you wouldn't go when i think of the elixir of life i feel like it'd be some sort deep of deep in the amazonian rainforest there's a fucking waterfall that god himself has pissed into and the water's sparkling, and there's a naked girl under the waterfall, and she's just like, you know, she's thousands of years old because she bathes in this, you know, god piss. 
That's what I imagine the elixir of life to be, not black granules granules of shit that explode. Some might argue that that would be very appealing. So people that like coffee. I'd argue that tea is no, the elixir that, of life. Right. Because coffee ain't the elixir of life, though, is it? You drink enough of it, you get a headache and anxious for the rest of the day. Yeah, that's why I said tea is the elixir of life, because I've been drinking tea all my life and I'm not dieting. David, yet. you drink too much tea. I'm on my <laughs> third cup, right? And I'm already getting the shakes. I don't know how you're doing it. I'm going to be pissed. Uh, I'm gonna i tell you how this. I do it. I have a steady heartbeat of 93 beats per minute, and I'm not in bad shape. I'm actually in quite good health. But I think I drink too much tea. I'm going to be up and down to the toilet too many times in this episode. Yeah, there might be some really rough cut editing in here because Ali's going to have to jump up and go and weird. You hear a lot of like moving around on... As on, he's shifting his yeah, legs. shifting my <laughs> legs and trying to like hold, hold it in. But no. Or hold the end of my penis and make it fill up like a water balloon. <laughs> <laughs> We're cutting that out of this goddamn thing. Everyone's done it. <laughs> no, they haven't. You know when you were a kid? No. I did. Good like, for you. Constantly. Just, <laughs> just. Can, you not? Can, we, can we not? Right. <laughs> can we... Let's go back to guns. I'm just saying. So there we are. <laughs> there we are. My, it was a very dangerous weapon, honestly. <laughs> because then you had this dilemma of like, what I'm going to do when I let go and just piss goes everywhere. <laughs> right so he's tried to invent this bloke <laughs> or lass i don't know who but they've invented gunpowder thinking they've invented the elixir of life we we'll soon find out that's what is not... gunpowder how do they do it so gunpowder is uh charcoal sulfate and no it's, yeah charcoal sulfur and Oh, bollocks. No, I know I'm gonna it. Get no, you. I know it. I know it. I know it. I know it. Give me a second. It's charcoal, sulfur, and. Oh, it's going to piss me off that. Ali, get up the cheat codes. Do you want to know what it is? Potassium. Potassium nitrate. Yep. Yeah. It's sulfur, carbon, and potassium nitrate. Right, we're going to do that again. So, David. What is gunpowder? <laughs> well, just thinking off the top of my head, uh, it's uh, potassium nitrate, carbon, and uh, sulfur. You've no. <laughs> <laughs> you you missed out on charcoal. Did you? No, carbon. Oh, yeah. The carbon's okay. the charcoal. Yeah, fair, okay. Yeah, fair enough. All right, go ahead. So, <clears throat> sorry, let's go again. Mm hmm. Uh, what is uh, gunpowder, anyway? So it's a combination of sulfur, uh, carbon, and potassium nitrate, or sometimes known as saltpeter. Okay. And what are the products of uh, combustion? The products of combustion? Yeah, you know, the products after you've, after the material is combusted. I don't know. It smells like eggs, so probably sulfur. <laughs> And it's 56% solid products, 43% gaseous products, and 1% water. Do you know what? That is not a concerning fact, because if you're on the receiving end of it, you're not going to be... The thing bothered. is, though, this thing that I've just brought up here, this is definitely going to be modern gunpowder. Uh, probably... Yeah, well, maybe. As, like... No, well, no, because we don't really use gunpowder anymore. Okay, modern in the sense of... There's going to be prototypes, you know, they're Mark 1. Yeah, so ain't going to be as good as Yeah, the absolutely. Mark like gunpowder gets refined and developed as the years go on. Um, you know, by changing sort of the the grain integrity to sort of like a finer powder, which is easier ignited, all that sort of stuff. But so the Chinese invent the gunpowder and they uh basically actually don't use it as for firearms or um explosives initially. Mm, they put it on top of their toast they they spread it on their toast um and they you know they eat eat the toast to get immortal life and then they drink a little bit of mercury just to really sort of take the edge off and uh, and then they would live forever because <laughs> you know how you said like surely these granules of blackness won't be you know that can't surely not be associated with some sort of elixir for life 
we're talking about a civilization where people did drink mercury thinking it was gonna keep them young keep them healthy oh god there was many an emperor who probably died of mercury poisoning wasn't there something like that for lead as well oh uh, yeah didn't people used Ars- to yeah lead arsenic radium there's always there's been years and when you discover a new material and it's fucking spectacular everyone thinks it's like the cure for all um and uh, and then it quite swiftly turns out to be not the cure for all it's probably mm. going to kill you who'd have sunk in fact like um you know the terracotta army yeah so that's part of a humongous uh temple or burial complex um and supposedly in amongst this like i think it's 50 square acres of land there is a sort of underground sort of throne room essentially and it's supposedly filled with rivers of mercury and things like that um but no one's ever gone in it because they don't they don't know if it's like super poisonous <laughs> so they're kind of like trying to work out if it's there or not but in the recordings of its construction that's supposedly what's happened surely there's like hazmat suit, hazmat suits you can go in yeah probably but also you don't want to be like knocking into stuff like that all willy-nilly it might come out like in the future like if they work out a way but a lot of modern archaeology is now more about, less so- about digging up and more about scanning the ground mm. because you are less likely to destroy the evidence or cause any issues by um because yeah by by scanning LIDAR rather than digging it shit. yeah because again well, probably not lidar a lot of ground, problems yeah. with archaeology as well comes from i've got a friend who's well into their archaeology and they would be able to like explain this way better than me but basically you've got the item itself but also the con- context that it was found in and so again by removing it from that space you remove the pot like the context forever so if let's say rock records got destroyed or whatever people wouldn't know the context of an item anymore because we removed it from its original context so it would make further learning harder um but i digress so anyway so they invent this stuff they don't use it in guns but they do use it in fireworks for entertainment but also on the battlefield as ways of signal signaling armies and sending off messages so they send up different fireworks to tell you when to do stuff or where to do stuff. Um, so that was initially what it was developed and, and utilized for. Um, but Did you get different colors in the flames? Yeah, yeah. At that time, I think you could, by mixing different materials and stuff, you could, you know, like modern fireworks, you can get different fire. Like, you know, obviously there's a lot of science behind it. Um, but back then they were doing the same sort of stuff. Well, the Chinese were pretty good at the old but- signaling and communicating over long distances weren't they uh i suppose so like they were they were they were very advanced like at that time they were a very advanced civilization um you know they had a lot of like years of doing stuff i suppose under their belts but they also like, yeah i don't know a lot of years building a big wall yeah they're building big walls like there's a lot of development um and like a lot of philosophy and sort of big thinking going on in China, as well as sort of technological inv- innovations in, in both engineering and, and chemistry and all this sort of stuff. It was a it was a real sort of like yeah, real cool place. But they invent this stuff. Uh, they use it for fireworks, and then obviously uh, China is part of what's known as the Silk Road, which is this big trade route that sort of travels all across the east over into Su- Europe. Sioux Canal. Yeah, it's kind of like that. Um, and so gunpowder inevitably got uh, its hands, like other people got hold of it. Um, and the Europeans actually got hold of it pretty, you know, within the 13th century. So like in the 1300s, Europeans were uh, accessing gunpowder and using gunpowder. Um, yeah, sorry, not the 13th century, the 14th century in 1300s. And they were using gunpowder um, for far more destructive means. Um, and the first... They just say like, you do you guys know what you have right like surely like why are you sending it up in the air like fireworks and shit like look look i've blown someone's leg off with this yeah watch what we can do aren't we so sophisticated look what i'm doing you're your using entire it to family s- yeah to, to <laughs> signaling you know people you're using it for sort of more altruistic means even if it's you know during warfare and stuff you're an idiot. What you need to do is use it to blow up your fellow man. Yeah, look. Because we're civilized. Look at your entire family. <laughs> Gone. See? The power. Look what you could have done. Yeah, so the Europeans took... Now get on this pile What could of... have been a, a very sort of, you know, just a material for entertainment and, and communication to whole new heights. And they created what was known 
as well they created the cannon like the original cannon the bombard as it was known which is a very large tube of iron um and you'd put gunpowder in it and a rock and uh you'd set fire to it and it'd shoot that rock at something i just like to think of the guys collecting those rocks yeah to be fair like, like is it like going down to like a i don't know like a reservoir or something, and you're just trying to find the perfect flat stone to skip. No, they would have just a bunch of guys like flicking through it, like no, can't no find like this, you know, or would they have like yeah, carved out. Basically, masons would have carved them into right. as best they could uniformed stones, essentially to shoot out of these things because you didn't want to get jammed in there because that would be game over. But like initial, like early firearms, like no, we're not going to go into artillery. That's a whole different kettle of fish. But they were pretty dangerous. Um, I remember there was an account, I can't remember what from what battle it was, but basically there was a guy who was defending the castle with a cannon. And I think this was 1400s. Um, and he got off three shots in the entire like battle um, and hit his mark every time. And that was so uncommon that instead of getting rewarded or, or, or you know, a promotion, he was uh, told... <laughs> That he is possessed by the devil and he needs to go on a pilgrimage. <laughs> so they were like, wait, you shot that thing three times in a battle. That's well good. And you hit everything every time. Devil, definitely possessed <laughs> by the devil. Get the fuck out of here. Uh, yeah, so they weren't particularly great feats of engineering and they were very dangerous. But obviously, if you've got the big version, people started to see that you could utilize it in a smaller version. And so the hand cannon was created. And this is just as crude as you think. It's a metal tube with sometimes a, a large bar that comes away from it um which sort of sits underneath the armpit um, and then you would hold the bottom of the tube with the bar underneath the armpit and you'd put your rock or your, if you've got actually carved ones you'd put those down in the tube with the gunpowder and then you just have a lit match essentially and you just hold it to the touch hole which is the little hole at the top where you put a little bit of gunpowder it'll burn through and shoot um, they were very, very unreliable. They were prone to blowing up in your face. Um, oh, God. Yeah, they were not particularly accurate any, over any great ranges. And culturally, they were pretty disdained, like these hand gunners, because they were essentially evening the playing field a bit. So before, if you were rich and you had like armor and stuff, like you got to go on the battlefield feeling fairly safe because you could, you're not, it's hard to kill you. Um, but then the hand cannon kind of changed that. And it meant that normal, ordinary soldiers could start seriously injuring or destroying uh, very expensive knights and men at arms and noblemen. And so they were pretty, pretty looked down upon. Plus, like archers and stuff like that, who were and crossbowmen, they were all employed. And, and again, they saw these people as pretty reckless and dangerous. There's gunpowder coming over here. Taking, taking our, our jobs. jobs. Yeah, exactly. There's probably a bit of that in it. But also because it didn't take any skill either. So like an archer would have spent years and years and years training up. Whilst if you wanted to be a hand cannon, you just had to have the balls to do it. Like do it. So uh, Sign this waiver. You may get blown up. You might get blown up. But you might take out a knight. So Sick bragging rights. Yeah, man. Don't tell anyone though. They might execute you. But yeah, sure. Um, so yeah. So that's, that's where the hand cannon starts. And... There's several different, again, there's no, uh, back then, there's no manufacturing process, really. So it's like, they're not entirely uniform. Each one was slightly different, different styles, different Ain't ideas. Ain't nobody 3D printing them. Yeah. And um, some even started to develop like a wooden stock to go underneath the barrel so you didn't burn your hands, you know, you know, just basic ergonomic stuff like that. Um, and that will, that starts to develop into something that we probably recognize as a gun today. Like if I showed you a hand cannon, like... I think when you're listening to me talk about it, it seems pretty self-explanatory. But I remember when I first came across one, I was like, I don't know what this is. It looks like a really weird mace. Like, it's a very strange looking thing. Um, uh, but yeah, so then we start to put like a wooden furnishings on the on the hand cannon. And we start to make it more ergonomic for a user. Sniper scopes, that kind of thing, yeah. Yeah, yeah, obviously. obviously. We're talking two times, four times. Mm -hmm. Eight times sniper scopes, variable scopes, yeah. infrared. Um, it made them a deadly, deadly adversary on the medieval battlefield. <laughs> uh, yeah, I can imagine a few years after the, you know, submachine guns were invented. Mm. It all happened away. in a space of a week, Ali. Uh, I thought, you know what? End of. End of. End of this and episode. That's the episode done. 
you know, they they put some wood on the bottom of the hand cannon and then, then they had an MG34 and that was it. It was game over and we're here today. Everyone else has just been copying since. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, so we start to get something that resembles what we would understand to be a gun and that would be the arquebus, which is... The arquebus. Sounds like... um. Old like folklore, like no, Krampus. The Krampus. The Krampus. If you do not behave this Christmas, and the Akubus will come and get you. Good fucking luck. That thing can't it's shit. Because <laughs> <laughs> that's another point is that these very early firearms have a very low rate of fire, so they have like you know one. I can imagine be one more... shot a minute, if that. I can imagine there'd be a bit of like scare tactics as well, like. Like they probably weren't, obviously they're not very accurate, but they probably made a shit ton of noise. Yep. Probably a lot of like flap, flap, you know, you could disorientate people pretty yeah. well, could you? If you were up close, you know, if they're up close, would you want to get close to that? No. If you and, knew and... as a knight, right, you're going in, yeah, they won't be able to hit you from a distance accurately, but just make sure they're not loaded when you're next to them because they'll fuck you up. Yeah, absolutely. Um and you know, and what they start to do is they develop like huge. They essentially start developing tactics to mitigate this inaccuracy. Force fields. For- <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they just they just get a bunch of the local wildlife and they just pile it up in front of them and then they shoot through the sheep. I've seen Independence Day, David. Explain no more. Force fields. Force Carry fields. on. I mean, to be fair, I mean, there are examples where not force fields, but where they use um, sort of mobile carts to essentially set up firing teams so that they could have a bit of cover. Essentially like a medieval tank, I suppose. But that doesn't come until a little bit so later. how powerful were they? Because could you so you theoretically know, get a barricade and walk your way down to the point where you could be a bit more effective in tackling them? Or would they just rip through? Oh, how powerful were the firearms? Yeah. Yeah, so the firearms were not super powerful to the point where actually some well-made armors could resist the strike there'll be a big fucking dent and you would feel like someone's like you know that force is still going to hit you but it might not go all the way through um so their their ranges are you know accurate to sort of about anywhere between sort of 80 to 100 yards ish um so not as bad as i thought no i mean i mean the uh, I don't know the, the the statistics for early arquebus, um, but it they don't. When you get like a later musket, the technology doesn't change too much. So you yeah. So we're talking about anywhere between like sort of eighty, eighty eight, average. We'll say eighty eighty yards, give or take. It's short anyway. Yeah, it's it's short enough, and your reload speed is long enough that you want to make sure you fucking hit what you're charging at because they're going to be on top of you before you can do anything about it. Um, But yeah, so they start to develop like shooting with like volleys. So essentially because the guns weren't particularly accurate, you're now just basically putting as many down range as you can, which is actually a a sort of a a theory and a principle of guns that essentially is around today. It's not changed. You know, that's why we have rapid fire firearms so we can put, more bullets down range because you increase the statistics, you increase the likelihood of hitting something. So, not only that, it keeps heads down, yeah, keeps heads down. But, yeah, so on the battlefield, you start to have these like huge troops of common men shooting and slaying, uh, you know, knights and people that are meant to be sort of uh, trained all their lives and so is it in that wealth. effective then for it yeah. to really change? Because this is what you know, you, you hear about it and you go, right, well. If they were that shit and that primitive at the time, surely someone should have gone, this ain't really working. Like, it's good, but it's not really that effective. Or is it just people going, you no, know, like any technology gun, this this is going to be fucking sick one day. There's potential Actually, here. Yeah. There probably is a lot of that going on, but, you know, people are developing them. Um, but I think the immediate appeal for many armies at the time would have been that you could hire these people with this stuff and it was easy to take up. Like if you were looking down the barrel of seven years of training with a bow or get the same pay, maybe even more pay doing a hand cannons job immediately, you probably see where you go. Um, Also, I can imagine it was probably cheaper because 
instead of getting a bunch of, you know, um, bowmen training them up, getting a bloody, you know, getting the bow done, getting their flexions and all that sort of stuff, you know, and, 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 and you know, and, and obviously there's a difference in quality there, especially, you know, you know, you got a knight with his sword and his, mm. you know, you have to get good, um, eye mongers and all that sort of stuff and like really know their craft to make really well you know I, I can imagine these are just sort of yeah here's a bloody tube tube stick some gunpowder down it i don't i don't know how it was gunpowder quite difficult to make back then i can't uh it would have been harder than it is today and it would have been a, a handcrafted exercise it wasn't like mass produced it would be well dangerous super well. dangerous my fucking god but yeah um because essentially you're you essentially just more and pestling it you just put oh. the stuff into the, the thing you just grind it all down and, and combine it in the right quantities to get the desired result but um but yeah so so it, it it's clearly effective enough that it's starting to catch on and it sticks around for years because we're talking like 1300s when we first start to see those on the european battlefield and it's not until the 1500s that we see them becoming what would you have done though? Like, if you're on the opposite end of that, receiving end of that, and you just hear it and see loads of like fucking bangs going off, and a couple of your mates get downed, and you're like, "What the fuck? What is this shit?" Or were they aware of? They would have been aware of that technology. Like, you know, surely there would have been one battle, or one person so, brought it in and and just shut up a load of people, and then they came back and went, "Yes, yeah, so they had this like magic boomstick," and it like. I don't know. Yeah, there's no doubt that. But also, you've got to understand that... My mate just had a massive hole in his head. Yeah, there, there probably would have been people like that on the battlefield. Because, But if you're looking at the sort of the knights and the sort of men-at-arms and these people that make a profession of warfare, they would have been very uh, aware of development technologies and very aware of how to utilise them. Because the people with the hand cannons wouldn't have just rocked up off their own fruition. They would have been hired in. So they would have been very aware that these things are rocking about, you know, keeping up to keeping up the stat, like, you know, keeping their, what's the saying? A finger on the pulse. There you go. So I don't think there would have been such a shock, but just maybe some people that haven't, some younger lads or people uh, in the lower echelons of the army, they might not have heard of it until they heard it. <laughs> they heard it and, they and, it. and it was over. <laughs> um, they heard it and their whole life went black. But the battle uh, that, solidifies firearms as being the future of warfare um and changes everything is is the battle of pavia which is in the i want to say 15 17 but i could be wrong Let's see how good my brain is ding 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 Ding, ding, ah, ding, ding, 1525. A few no, years you, off. No, you were fine. A yeah, few fine. years off. So 1525, Battle of Pavia. I don't we think got... we're going to be known as the most accurate podcast. Uh, <laughs> We can't be spouting lies. No, we can't be spouting lies. But there might be some discrepancies in terms of dates. Yeah, we're going to try and like, get there'll those. There'll be a few years we're off. Trying to, we are going to get those right. Like, yeah. like, we're going to try and make sure we don't fudge anything. But... um. You know, there might be a few things that slip through the cracks when we get carried away. But yeah, so the Battle of Pavia, you've got the French and they're fighting against the Spanish. Um, and uh, yeah, the Spanish come out on top, I think. Oh God, it's been so long since I've looked at it. Ah, uh, yeah, so it's the Holy Roman Emperor, Charles V. That's a um, sick fucking flag. It's a cool flag, isn't it? Yeah. So the so yeah, the, the French are fighting against the Holy Roman Emperor and the Spanish. Um and Austria as well. Because uh, to put it to put it bluntly, basically the Holy Roman Empire was sort of the Germanic areas at the time, and Charles V was already King of France, but the Holy Roman Emperor was essentially elected into the position um from neighboring areas so he became holy Roman emperor so he then was like king of all of those areas as well as spain um 
which sounds great, but we need to remember that this poor fuck, uh, Charles V, also was terribly inbred and had a fucking chin. In fact, Ali, I will find you a picture of this man because it's going to make you laugh. Charles the Chin. <laughs> Holy mother of God. Look at that chin. And we've got to remember that this would be in a flattering portrait made of him, not an accurate one. Let me just... Basically, there was so much inbreeding that this prominent chin became a feature of their family. And then it started to take on a bit of a sort of like, oh, he's got the chin. <laughs> That's a good thing. Oh not, not, God. not that man has an incredible underbite and he needs, he needs some serious help. Like eating must be a nightmare. You dribbling see, all the time. See, on this one, you can see he's got a bit more, his like lips a bit more pulled forward. Yeah. In this one, he's a bit more normal. Yeah. He just looks like he's got a longer face. Oh, and he's grown a beard to hide it, which is very clever. That's that's very, uh, you know, using using very beard, modern day techniques exactly like. to sort of bring shape to your face. But yeah, he had an absolute chomper, man. Um, but anyway, so that was about the Pavia, um, and that was decisive victory for the Holy Roman Emperor um, and the Spanish because they were utilizing uh, firearms in a really effective manner. And by this point. Um, in the 1500s what was uh, battlefields used to be dominated by the heavy cavalry charge they would make and break most battles mm. um, but because of the introduction of firearms and actually a resurgence in pike use so pikes fell out of favor for a long time the the greeks famously used pike formations to uh, defeat their enemies and um, but they start to be reintroduced and readopted and you start to get what is then kind of the uh combination of pike and musket which becomes predominantly how wars are fought for uh, a long time like hundreds of years after this point um and so the the relevance of heavy cavalry becomes less and less and less over the years from that point on and armor disappears for a few reasons um but gunpowder is certainly one of the big reasons um because it meant that the armor was no longer a guaranteed investment in your safety because whilst you probably could adopt armors, and they certainly did attempt to make bulletproof armors and were successful in many spots, um, it just becomes this arms race. And as the guns get better, the armor struggles to keep up. Yeah, back then as well. I can't imagine... Like now we've got cool new synthetic materials. Yeah. Like bulletproof vests and all that sort of stuff. You know, But they're not metal. They're just lovely material that can take impacts really well yeah absolutely and you know um, so that was uh 1525 um, when you're working with metal and you can only do so much of it i mean i guess you can make it thicker but then that's what they do can't... essentially they just make it thicker and they also change the consistency of the armor so they were before going for very high carbon content in their armor to make it very strong and rigid um, but as firearms got introduced and they tried to adapt to armor to deal with that, they actually reduced the carbon levels in the armor to make it slightly softer. Because what would happen is if it was too rigid, the impact from the bullet or the, the round would shatter the armor essentially, it would break through. But by reducing, by increasing thickness and reducing the strength of the armor or the rigidity of the armor, it actually allowed the armor to absorb the energy. And would actually, oh. so actually by making it softer slightly, it increased its usefulness. That must against. be a well fine line between making Super it soft fine. enough that it does that, but hard enough that mm -hmm. it don't go all the way through. But you can already see why the armor starts to fade because it's it just becomes too much a hassle to keep up with it. And also, money. Yeah. Like, and the guys you're putting it on. Like they're, they're only that so strong. Exactly. It becomes impractical. Um, you know, until they start, you know, armor's not going to come back in a big way until they can start like creating like mech suits for people. And even then, the like the investment you would have to put into each individual soldier would be so astronomical that they would find better ways of de doing with like dealing with warfare and stuff. So sorry to any like sci fi fans out there, like anyone that likes Warhammer or anything, but big giant power armor is probably not going to happen. And not until it becomes really cheap, <laughs> which I doubt it will. But yeah, so so we're looking at, yeah, well, what did I say? 1525, Battle of Pavia. We start to introduce pike and shot formations. Um, and eventually, 
we get towards the end of the 1500s and the beginning of the 1600s and the arquebus is then formally turned into what we'd know as a musket the arquebus arquebus because children at christmas or the arquebus will get you but yeah so they change it into the musket and i think that's probably where most people who don't have too much knowledge of the um of firearms and history and stuff well you know everyone knows what a musket is i reckon um so not everyone david you know you know what they say when you assume you make an ass out of me and you, you sharp so a musket a musket talk to me talk to you about a musket so a musket is very similar to the arquebus but it's for probably better uh it's again more ergonomic um it's smooth bore, which means well, that'll make more have more relevance later down the line. But it means it has a similar accuracy of those arquebuses. Um, but what the musket has is a, and to be fair, some of the arquebuses also had it, but it has a mechanical ignition source. So before you were basically holding this thing and using your hand and a lit match to dunk into the hole yourself and then what you start to develop like a, into like a traditional cannon that you see yeah on the side of pirate ships there we go like that pirate ships like that but also they they had a better ignition source they didn't they wouldn't just use their hands anyway but we're not doing artillery i said this earlier oh, you bastard David. you bastard i want to know when the rail guns come out the, well they're on their way my friend i've and, watched, I've watched and... youtube videos and the ray guns. When are we going to talk about the ray gun? When I'm damn well ready. <laughs> <laughs> this is not a futurist post. This is not future tea. This is history tea. God damn it. And you will respect my authority. <laughs> okay. But yeah. Muskets. Muskets. And the first largely adopted style of musket is called the matchlock musket. Is that the one that looks like it's got a horn? Like it looks like the instrument horn like they're like was that more blunderbuss that's they, oh that's a blunderbuss yeah that's, they, that's they, different they more flare out at the end yeah that's a blunderbuss okay so sorry. the matchlock musket is yeah a uniformed barrel all the way down no no flare or anything in it uh typically wooden uh furnishings or stock um and the way it would operate is you would place the gunpowder down the barrel because these are all barrel loaders um, you would then place your uh, musket ball and then you would place a bit of paper or cloth, which was known as wadding. What, are you sending a note? Yeah. Fuck you, off. Yeah, you, yeah. yeah. <laughs> you write on the wadding what you want to tell the person you're shooting. Um, <laughs> it was an early adoption of before like the postmasters and stuff, but yeah, it was ultimately seen as a bad idea because too many people died. I imagine it's nice for the family as well, you know, when they're like doing an autopsy. And, and they like, put out like, sorry, yeah. Wasn't personal, just business. <laughs> King told me to do it. Soz. <laughs> yeah. Um, oh, God. Yeah. <laughs> no, so the, the bit of paper or cloth is so that, one, so that if you lowered your musket downwards, the barrel ball would just roll out the end. Oh, okay. And two, it enabled you to make the explosive and the ball more compact. And the reason you want to do that is for, well, for energy so by making it more compact, uh, the explosive. Less air to escape around the... the yeah, exactly. Um, also, gunpowder is actually a really slow burner. So if you put it on a table, for instance, you'd light it and there'd be a big like, puff of smoke and flame, but it wouldn't blow the table up. You have to put it in a container to give it that well, it's explosive like energy. Well, if you got like a firecracker and you put it in your open palm and lit it, yeah. it'd probably burn your hand and, you know... But if you clenched it... If you it, clenched your fist, you'd you, probably blow your hand up. Yeah, exactly. So it's it's one of those. Um, and so, yeah, so you do that. Oh, and also, like you said about air, you don't want any air pockets in there. Because mm. if that air expands in anywhere other than out the end of that tube, again, you can cause things to explode inside the firearm. So it's probably why a lot of them exploded early on because they didn't know the techniques properly or the science behind it. But yeah, so you do all that. I guess there is a gaping hole in the the firing hole that's a secondary hole isn't it yes it's very small though it's very small it's like you could barely get a toothpick in it kind of small oh, okay um like so they must have known roughly the kind of they knew how to make a gunfire one way yeah 
Yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah. But okay. but it, with the air and stuff, it's probably something that's developed. Um, and with a musket, you have what is called a scouring stick, um, and you would then remove the scouring stick from below the barrel, and you would flip it around, shove it down the barrel to ram everything down and make sure it's all compact. So once you've done all that, you're now ready to fire the firearm. Then you've got... You look down it just to double check. Yeah, yeah. You stick it in your mouth to make sure it tastes right. Um, (laughs) (laughs) After all, it is the elixir of life. It is the elixir of life. So you want to suck a bit of that back out before you shoot at your friend. Could you imagine if it was the elixir of life and everyone's shooting each other with it and they're all dropping and getting straight back up like, I feel great. Oh, I needed that. I needed that. Cheers, man. (laughs) Uh, that would be the best war. <laughs> maybe it's why the Chinese didn't use it at first. They probably thought it still was the elixir of life, maybe. They probably were superstitious about it. Yeah. That. Anyway, so you do all that, and then you're ready to fire the gun. Now what's left is on the side of the musket is what is a little shelf, and this shelf is called the pan. And you put more gunpowder in the pan, and that's essentially somewhere to... It's essentially a way of uh, sitting next to the touch hole. Right. And there's also a cover that you can slide over the top to keep the gunpowder in it, um, or mainly to uh, keep the pan from accidentally being ignited. So it's to cover it up. So if you're not going to fire straight away, um, or even during the loading process, you want to make sure that's covering the gunpowder. Um, otherwise, yeah, you could accidentally discharge before you want, and it's easily done. I've uh, I've done it a few times. Nearly blew my fingers off. Nearly blew my friend's face off. Oh, yeah. Luckily, we're firing blanks and everything was fine, but it was it was a bad day, and it's caught on video, and you can't really see it. But if you know that we're both absolutely about to shit ourselves, uh, then you can see it. Oh, okay. So it's like a yeah, because I, I yeah, it was it was a bad day. Anyway, so you, yeah, you got the pan to keep that nice and safe. Now, once you've done that, you've got your gunpowder in there, um, pans closed. Uh, although sometimes what they would do. No, that's exactly what you do. Sorry. Gunpowder in the pan, pan closed, and then you have your match. Now, your match at this point is a bit of rope dipped in saltpeter um, or potassium nitrate, um, and that allows the rope to burn slowly, um, but hot, a bit like a cigarette. Right, okay. So, you, you, and what you want to do is blow on it until you've got a nice sort of like, typically, you want a nice little pencil point on it that's glowing orange. That's going to be like your top dog stuff. But to be fair... God, I can imagine in the cause, battlefield cause, that ain't possible though, is it? Like, no. Now, ideally, like they're all sitting there and they're like class, gun shooting class. Now, typically, you're going to want a nice pencil type sharp The thing is, point. And then in the battlefield, it's pissing wet. There's fucking mud everywhere. Don't. You're trying to fucking... Get you're you're shitting like... yourself because you've got people charging it. Yeah. Also shooting weapons. And you're there trying to load yours. You fucking... Salt peat has gone out. Life's not good. Yeah, well, this this is the thing. Like, there was a lot of um, practices that caused dangers. I can imagine it's like... And accidents. Yeah, it's very much perfect conditions for the best possible... Like, now, at least there's... You know, guns are reliable. Well, most, you know, some are... They're mostly reliable with good maintenance and all that sort of yeah, stuff. Yeah, reliable, safe enough. Yeah. They've got safety mechanisms built into them. Accurate. Yeah. You can shoot multiple rounds down. You know what I mean? Like, but, you know, I can't... When I mean, you're practicing doing it in a yeah, nice so warm they, day, probably. Yeah. You've got a nice, like, open field with, like, a nice, you know... Well, unfortunately for a lot of these lads, especially during the English Civil War, when men were uh desperately needed they were getting like sometimes as little as an afternoon's training with them before being sent out oh my god yeah um but <laughs> good luck lads see you later <laughs> you're gonna be fine <laughs> <laughs> it's so sad um, Me- meanwhile one of them one of them in the background is literally just blowing himself up oh, don't don't mind him he it was does idiot. happen though man <laughs> But funny enough as well, though, gunpowder, whilst it is incredibly volatile and will always go off when you don't want it to, sometimes won't go off when you do. Like, it can be really, really stubborn. So, any like, a rainy day, uh, and if your gunpowder's getting a bit damp... That Just could, humidity. Yeah. Right. yeah. So, if, if, it, if it gets too wet, it won't go. So, it's quite susceptible to sort of, like, environmental things. Um, but, yeah, so, you've got all that. You've got your match. You then put your match on the... Well, they sometimes called it serpent's head, but it's basically like a, a lever on the side of the gun, which has a little pinching prong at the end, and you just wedge the rope into the, between the pinching prongs. 
Right. And you can sometimes with some of them tighten that to make sure it grips it nice and tight. Um, and then when you're ready, you'll bring the firearm up to your shoulder and hold it against the shoulder that way uh, to deal with the recoil. Um, some of these early muskets were very large, very long, very heavy. So sometimes you actually had a stand that you'd prop them up on. Tripod? A bit like a tripod, but it was mainly just a stick with a spike. So you put the stick with the spike in the ground and there's a little prong on the top that you can rest the gun on. How long that stick with a spike lasted? <laughs> They're quite well-made sticks with spikes. Uh, but anyway, um, and then you would open the pan up uh, and you'd pull the trigger. And as you pull the trigger, um, the trigger simply makes the mechanism drop, the little arm drop down into the pan. And hopefully, if everything's gone right, you'll ignite the powder in the pan, which burns through the touch hole into the charge of the breech of the barrel. And If them. not, you're going home with no jaw. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, if it doesn't go well, um, then either it didn't shoot and you got skewered by whatever you're trying to shoot, um, or it blew up. But yeah, people people used to make mistakes with that stuff all the time. Like one of the things, because again, keeping the match lit was quite important to being able to fire um, rapidly, obviously, because you don't want to be relighting that thing over and over again. And uh, it's a difficult thing to do. So a lot of the time, some of the musketeers would adopt having it wrapped around their hands when they're not when they were doing the rest of the loading processes and stuff, so they could quickly keep blowing on it and then continue their practices. Okay, like on the back of the hand or something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I can imagine that also is dangerous. Yeah, You're super handling dangerous. Super dangerous. Fucking gunpowder. Yeah, 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 yeah. And you've got this burning thing. I can yeah. imagine embers fall off and shit. Like with modern practices, certainly with our safety policies, if we ever do like a gun shooting thing, um, we actually have two people involved. So one person holds the match until the other person's ready to fire. <laughs> Very far away. <laughs> yeah. And basically the gunpowder charge or the gunpowder horn, which you keep your gunpowder in, uh, we make sure that is always uh, swapped over to make sure that yeah, the match and that does not come into contact. It's, it's a very sort of meticulous thing we do today. But back then, when we didn't you have the luxuries no, for one, it. One Kate, you just couldn't get this gunpowder to light. Oh, you were there with like, what was, what was basically a fucking lit flame going, yeah. please fucking light. light. And it just wouldn't go. <laughs> so I was like, you don't expect that. Like gunpowder is very... This is a thing. Like you watch, um, uh, what's the film about um, Guy Fawkes? I don't know what the film is, but the gunpowder plot. Yeah. Oh, what was it called? How bloody... Oh, it's that recent one. The... V for Vendetta. V for Vendetta. Uh, okay, yeah. But you just, ex- you know, you watch, uh, it doesn't, not even that film, just any film with fucking gunpowder. I'm pretty gun- sure it uses C4. Gunpowder as a bloody weapon. And they always blow themselves up instantly because a light breeze came in the room. Yeah. And a couple of them rubbed together and a small spark was, yeah. like, you know, ignited it all. But sometimes that is, does happen. Yeah, no, I, I can there's, imagine. There's a real but, inconsistency but, with but it. But then you, you, you were telling me just like, yeah, literally we just couldn't get this thing to light. Like the one where we accidentally discharged when we weren't ready was because there was a single grain sat on top of the pan and a tiny bit of the, the just a little ember fed off the thing, hit that single grain, set that off, which was enough to set the stuff off in the pan. It was it was a real freak accident, but it does happen. So it's really dangerous. But there was a, one story where a guy went to refill his powder flask from a big barrel of the stuff with the match still in his hand. Boom. Blew himself up. Poor guy. Yeah, not great. But no. So they're pretty, they're still very dangerous for the user, but we're now looking at, thanks to drill practices and through uh, a sort of a standardization of how to use the firearm, the rate of fire goes up from one a minute to two. Shots in a minute. Oh, you're yeah. right. For your two, yeah. two, ra- <laughs> two rounds. Yeah, per pretty consistent. Two shots a minute. We're looking pretty fly here, guys. So is that is that just from just that t- using yeah. the pan technique? Yeah. So the 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 slight innovation of having a mechanical ignition on the gun, which is both there to make it safer for the user, but also more con- yeah uh, yeah, but also helps with sort of speeding up the process. Um, and the firearm itself. Uh, uh, and the drilling, sorry, the drilling and the practicing and the yeah the uniformity of how to operate also increases the rate of fire. So, and that that's ultimately the everyone's gun goals is to make it more Not accurate. Not kill the user. <laughs> yeah, safer, more accurate, 
high rate of fire. Those are typically the ambitions, and that's the general trend of how guns develop over the years. Um, and so during the English Civil War... Or if you're in America, you know, being able to buy a semi-automatic uh, for uh, hunting uses. Yes, yeah, yes. That seems to be pretty... Well, the hunting area does have a lot of innovations in it, to be fair, and a lot of the progression in uh, firearms uh, come, some of them come from the hunting arena and the sports shooting Marcus, side of it. I thought that was a joke, David. <laughs> you can't joke to me about history. <laughs> I was joking. Irrelevant, yeah. It, it was mainly just <laughs> around the stupid gun laws in America again, getting political. <laughs> <laughs> Get the politics out. We said we said no politics. Right. Back to the history. Stop licking sugar off a plate, you weirdo. Yeah, it's so good. It's like crack, mate. <laughs> so we had some donuts. Yeah, we did. They were lovely. And he's just licking the old sugar that's been left on the plate. Don't judge me. I'm judging. Um, but yeah, so we used that technology throughout the uh, English Civil War. Oh, it's so good. I'm sure it is. <laughs> and, uh, and the next development in the firearm is, oh, again... One minute. <laughs> <laughs> oh god, I have me. Oh no, I've got a hair. <laughs> oh fuck. Oh, it could be any of ours. I'm so hairy, I need a hair. Ah, oh, there we go. Right, right. I'm ready. So the next development in the firearm is uh, again, we've still got muskets, um, but we have changed the ignition and we have changed the uh so firing drills and the ammunition slightly. So the next sort of like big leap forward, you could argue, is like the Brown Bess, which is a bit of a nickname given to a lot of muskets during the sort of late 1700s, early 1800s. So it's 200 years before we started getting like... Started to change things. Well, no, um, sorry. In the English Civil War, I forget, the, this innovation comes in. Um, this next step in the innovation comes in and that technology is flintlock technology. So it, they do start to develop it, but it's not given... Not this, sponsored by, but would like to be. Would like to be sponsored by flintlock muskets. <laughs> um, <laughs> if you're listening. Uh... Um, so the technology was being developed, but it wasn't like used en masse for a lot later. Until a lot later. So when was that? Um, so we're looking at sort of like 16, uh, sort of 1640s to That's 1650s. still a hundred odd years at advanced, like future. Like They refined the technology but the flintlock is the next step forward, if you know what I mean. Yeah. So the brown bess is, is a lot later down the line, but it's, the technology it's using is, has been well established by that point. Mm. And it's started to come into innovation by the end of the like 1650s. But, okay. Sorry, the end of the 1640s and early 1650s. So the flintlock is just... Well, uh, this is... Uh, so you heard of a flintlock, hasn't you? Like a flintlock musket. No. I've heard of flintlock. I've never... I don't know what. It is. Yeah. That's fine. Uh, have you heard of a wheel lock? No. No. So, HD DVDs and Blu-rays. This is that, but in muskets. So, basically, at the same time, you had a flint lock and a wheel lock. And the both will work on the same principle. They both use flint as an ignition source. Now, with a flint lock, the way it operates is you crank back the hammer. That's got the flint in it. You then have what's called a frizzen, which sits on top of the pan, which is a tall bit of steel. You pull the trigger, a spring snaps the hammer forward, scrapes the steel, drags the sparks down into the pan below, ignites the weapon. The wheel lock... Like a lighter. Like a lighter. The wheel... No, the, yeah, the wheel lock is like a lighter. Oh, okay. So it's more like a lighter oh, than... It. So basically what you have is... <laughs> You're just there like, please light. <laughs> please fucking light. It's a bit windy. It's a bit of wind. Yeah. It's, it's raining a off. bit. It won't like, go off. Please, come on. Um, so the wheel lock um, is a, if you imagine like a, a grind wheel on the side of the gun right. and you have to then take a spanner, crank it up so the spring engages. Oh, this is effort. Place the hammer down onto the wheel, Already, the pull the trigger steps. and the wheel would spin rapidly causing the spark to go off and set the fun, uh, firearm off. Okay. The wheel lock doesn't win out. Out of the two technologies. Uh, yeah, I'm not surprised. <laughs> On paper, the wheel lock is a far better igniting mechanism. It's far more reliable. But in practical application, the flintlock was far easier to use. Because if you lost the spanner for your wheel lock, you couldn't reload your weapon. The time it took to do it also was a lot longer. Also, the wheel lock 
was prone to failure if you left it cranked for too long because the metallurgy at the time wasn't good enough to keep the springs engaged. So they would often lose their springiness if they... It's just more mechanical warped. parts, isn't it? Exactly. There's more to go oh. wrong. Whilst the flintlock, basically, even in the 1800s, the flintlock was only shooting maybe, would only ignite six times out of ten. But the process of redoing it is as simple as cranking it back closing the pan and shooting again mm. and hopefully at this time it will go so the the flintlock wins out um and the innovation to if we jump forward to the brown best now the innovation with sort of firing drills as well is that instead of having all your components such as your musket ball your gunpowder and your wadding all in separate containers um you're now having them in a single cartridge so you have the the musket ball you then have the what is known as cartridge paper that's where we get that from it's like a waxed paper um you then sort of like put the musket ball in the bottom wrap the paper over it twist it and then you have like a pouch at the top which you pour the gunpowder into and then you seal it off at the top and then the way you'd work it is very simply you pull that cartridge out you'd bite the top of the cartridge rip the paper off with your mouth spit the bit of paper out and probably some gunpowder it tastes like shit uh, and then, no, David, elixir of life. Sorry, elixir of so life. Of course, we have to look. They have to, you know, taste it. Taste before, it before before they shoot. It. Yeah, obviously, that seems to be a common common part of the practice. Common part of yeah, yeah firing okay. weapons back in the day. You are right. Yeah, but if you imagine the elixir of life tastes like s- the sand in in your food at the beach, but worse. Does it taste eggy? No, it doesn't taste eggy. It smells eggy. It tastes like. The worst part of burnt food. It's not great. And it's dry, man. Dries your mouth out. Anyway. (laughs) I wouldn't put it on my chips. Uh, Yeah, there's no substitute for salt. (laughs) They did try once. Uh... Blew his teeth off. (laughs) Old Gummy's over there. Thought he'd be smart and put fucking gunpowder in his chips. (laughs) Fucking potato and teeth everywhere. (laughs) Now look at him smiling in the corner with his gums. Stop looking at me, gummy. <laughs> He's just got this hole in the bottom of his like jaw. Anyway. Someone has to come along with a pan just to collect all the, oh, the, all the pus. And, oh, no. And I don't, <laughs> anyway. Oh, God. I do need a piss, though. So, one sec. I told you. <laughs> I told you this would happen. Give me another tea. And he's uh, like, oh, well, it's not history tea without tea, is it? I'm like, fair enough. You got me there. So I'll have one more. Now look at me. Go for a wee. Go for a wee. I'll entertain him whilst you're gone. Okay, yeah. Yeah. This is uh, David's segment of the show. Welcome to the segment where I get to talk and Ali's not here. It is well snowing outside. I know it's blizzarding, but I didn't want to mention anything because I knew he'd shout at it. He's like, why is it snowing? It's spring. Anyway, yeah, gunpowder tastes disgusting. Do not recommend. Other tips with gunpowder, do not put on your eyes. Again, it hurts. Do not put on anything that you don't want to explode because it will. Um, what else do you want to not do with gunpowder? Oh, there was a cool practice that people, uh, again, we're looking 1800s and a little bit later, but there was like this practice of saber sparring. And one of the things they would do was you would cut the cheek during the fight and that was the target area. And uh, if you got that cut, it was sort of a sign of that you kind of had a good upbringing and that you were a valiant person. So often they would rub gunpowder into that cut to make sure it's scarred really well. Um, so that's something you could do with gunpowder. But he's back. He's back. And we're going to end David's segment on what not to do and to do with gunpowder and return to the main programming. I just don't like how it's really fucking snowy. It's mad, isn't it? So you bite the top of the cartridge off. You pour the gunpowder in. You then shove the paper and the burn, the musket ball all down in one. Oh, one minute. Why? You know when you get really comfy? Yeah, I know. And then you move. Move, get, yeah. yeah. And you get back and you can't get into the same position again. He's fidgeting. Every, everything's changed. Okay, I feel... I feel um, okay. Wait. Let's go with that. This 
This will be fine. Yeah. So, there we are. And then you ram everything down with what is now known as a ramrod, which is essentially the same thing as a scouring stick. I don't know why they're different names, but, you know, got to be trying to be accurate. Uh, yeah. And, uh, and you shoot it. Oh, and one tip for anyone using a musket, don't forget to take out the ramrod. Because, yes, you will skewer a guy spectacularly, but you will not be able to reload your weapon. Oh, did you bring spares? No. So just pray you never did it. Uh, David's top tip of the... Don't leave stick in barrel. Yeah. <laughs> when shooting someone, don't leave other things in the barrel. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so that's the that's the process of the that that flintlock, um, and around the brown vest times they are starting to deviate in sort of gun sizes as well to for different purposes. So a carbine is typically a shorter musket or a shorter rifle to make it. They were initially created for cavalry, um, but nowadays a carbine version of a firearm might be used for close quarters and CQB and that sort of stuff. Um, or for maritime use as well, because you're, again, fighting in close war quarters. Um, but typically, carbines are not really a th- much of a thing anymore because most firearms, like most service issue rifles, are kind of all-purpose and they're designed to work in different scenarios rather than for a very particular job. But anyway, digress. And also, the trumpet one, the blunderbuss, mm. that's starting to see a thing, and that's essentially a shotgun of the day. Mm. There you go. So... Did you just chuck anything down? And- yes. I love it. Don't recommend. You recommend pellets because, again, you likely are just she causing wife. issue. Come on, get in here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we're just... We're just <laughs> it's fine. Get in. No, but you, you could uh, put, like, rocks and bits of shrapnel and stuff in it. Like, it didn't have to be uniform stuff. Um, cause, and that's another thing. People think the blunderbuss flare at the end is to increase spread. Um, it's actually to make it easier to pour the ball bearings and stuff in. Oh, just all like yeah, like to fun- a funnel. It's a funnel. It's oh, not wow. yeah, it's not a flare to a spread. It's a funnel to contain essentially, which is cool. That makes sense because mm. you'd you'd probably be thinking right, but if it was all you, I mean, I know they had pretty big barrels, but mm. if you're like trying to pick up loads of stuff and you're trying to yeah, what, <laughs> I'll probably get rid of this bit because I don't know what I'm saying. Um, yeah, like if you're just trying to pick up stuff in your hand and like yeah, funnel it into a, a small barrel, yeah, you're gonna just gonna piss everywhere. Exactly, um, and also like so at this point during the 1800s as well, like you've got quite a dedicated naval force and they're using very similar weapons, but they're also um, some of them, not all of them, but some of them are actually cast in brass rather than in steel, and that's because brass doesn't um, uh, rust as much. So, yeah. So that's why they use those. They also had a really cool gun called the knock gun. So if you imagine a musket, but it has six barrels instead of just one. Six barrels. No, and it all goes off at once. So you have to fill up six times. Yeah, it's a one-shot thing. Like, you, you... What was that for? So that was typically... Was that the end boss or something? <laughs> yeah. Oh, he's coming. Bring what? the big gun. <laughs> You're not wrong, man. It was there to pick off um, naval officers. So you'd be up in the crow's nest with it. And because, again, accuracy was not great on muskets at the time, they couldn't didn't really have a legit way of sniping. So they put six barrels on this thing because they thought, well, one of the six is going to fucking hit six him. Six is better than one. <laughs> Problem was they had very limited service. And that's because if you shoot six muskets, it's going to take your fucking shoulder off. Yeah. Like one musket kick is pretty pretty substantial. Six is ungodly. And so they used to just cause too much injury and they just weren't very popular, so they, they stopped using them. Um, and then, actually speaking of naval, the next big development, again, is in the ignition type. So we've gone from matchlock to flintlock. We're now going to hammerlock. And again, the naval guys were some of the first to adopt this on a larger scale because of keeping powder dry. And the way this one works is... And this was innovated through the hunting area. So joking aside, basically when people were hunting with flintlocks, they found that the flash in the pan, because it was all external, would scare off the fucking ducks and shit that they were trying to shoot before the bullet went down. Would the noise not do that though? Uh, The, I don't know. Obviously get the flash before the bang, but I could imagine 
so yeah so because basically you ain't when you fire the musket it it is pretty rapid but there is a slight delay between the flash and the bang and so if you hear a <laughs> it might just be enough for the duck to fuck off but anyway um so they developed the hammerlock and the hammerlock is essentially <laughs> you're gonna like this right so instead of the flintlock and the exposed pan you have an internal pan uh, no not even that it's essentially they've elongated the touch hole and on top of the touch hole is a nipple mm. yeah i knew you'd like that nipple i just love it's fucking hilarious when you're trying to talk to someone about guns and they're like so this is the nipple and nearly everyone smirks even just a sl- yeah nipple. it doesn't matter how old you are it doesn't matter who you are if you say the word nipple when you're trying to talk about a gun people go <laughs> <laughs> Nipples. Nipples. So yeah, so you got the nipple, and uh, which is like just an extended uh, touch hole, essentially. And you put this little thing on top of it, which is a little black, like a brass capsule, and it's called a percussion cap. Uh, it's a bit like, um, actually, probably not, but like early. Well, it is a bit like a cap gun. Like, All right. Yeah. So you know, you get those little things. So that's essentially the same thing, um, and it's filled with a, an explosive called fulminant of mercury. Which only goes off under impact. Uh, also, another elixir of life. Yeah. Also, drink that. Uh, <laughs> it's great for your teeth. Um, <laughs> and uh, <laughs> and uh, and then the instead of having the, the flint on the hammer, you've just got the hammer essentially. And when you pull the trigger, the hammer comes crashing down, hits the percussion cap, which will then explode into the touch hole or the nipple, and uh, ignite the charge inside. Um, and that will shoot the weapon. So that was another development that comes up. Um, oh, and also I will say as well, a kind of chrono- chronolog- chronologically, we fuck a bit fucked up because um, I forgot to tell people about the rifle. Oh, David. Well, we might as well just quit now. I'm sorry. I'm sorry, guys. I'm sorry, listeners. But the rifle. So the rifle comes sorry in. Sorry for his incompetence here. So I think the first ever rifle invented, I could be wrong, actually, but one of the earlier <laughs> rifles invented was called a Brunswick rifle. And what a rifle is and why it's different to a musket is that inside the barrel, they, um, actually, that's really wrong because actually the first rifle was actually invented during Henry VIII's period in the 1500s, but they couldn't do it consistently enough to make it a viable technology. Anyway, but you basically cut grooves into the inside of the barrel and that causes the projectile to spin Mm -hmm. uh, upon shooting rather than being smooth, which doesn't cause this. And as you know, if something's spinning, you get like essentially a stabilizing force. It's why arrows have fletchings on them to help them spin, to make them travel further. And so that's a huge jump in technology. Um, and that comes in. It's mad that no one thought about that prior. Like, because obviously the technology for arrows and fletchings were designed to do that. In the yeah. Year, but like, did they not think, did someone not go, oh, you know what, maybe we should. But then again, I guess someone would have to figure out oh actually if you put grooves inside the barrel as opposed to on the exactly how do you projectile, yeah so how do you make a, do you a, a round bullet it? do yeah. that yeah exactly so there was a lot of things to overcome um but yeah and one of the sort of most sort of well-known rifles and some of the earliest sort of like rifles that the british used was uh the baker rifle which was famously used by uh the um what was it? Sharp. Matt Baker. No, you know, you BBC. know. BBC. <laughs> yeah. You know. Um, he made it. Uh, rifleman, funny enough, um, in the British Army. And that's what Sharp was. If you ever watch Sharp with uh, the guy who dies all the time, Sean Bean. Bastard. Bastard. Yellow belly bastard. bastard. But yeah, he sort of, uh, he was playing one of those guys and the rifle was their thing. They were kind of skirmisher troops when most of the army would have used smoothbore because they were line infantry. But these guys were designed to sort of like shoot important targets and shit like that, like snipe people. Um, but yeah, and so and then once, so so we get the rifle quite early on in the eighteen like eighteen hundreds and even a little bit earlier. Um, but the reason why the regular line infantry don't get given the rifle is because of rate of fire. Because for rifling to work, the bullet has to touch the barrel edges, and that makes reloading really slow because you the bullet essentially has to get hammered down it's really tough to get down the barrel so they didn't give also, it also sure that'd be tough to get in out as well would it well no because you shoot it yeah but you still got those 
It's still a lot of friction to be able to. Yeah, but that's okay because it, it causes it to spin. Oh, it has to right. be engaging and touching essentially to cause that rotation. Oh, because the grooves would mm-hmm. then make it follow that like like a screw. Yeah, almost. kind of. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, that makes sense. So, so that was uh, a big problem because you know obviously it'd be great to have every soldier with a rifle because they could shoot further and more accurately, but we can't compromise on the rate of fire, which admittedly was only like three to four rounds a minute, but it was still really important to be keeping fire going down range. Um, so the develop when the rifles become standard issue for at least in the British Army, it comes with the P fifty three, um, and the genius of the P fifty three is the actual ammunition they used. It's called a minier round, and it looks a little bit less like a musket ball and more like that conical shape that we would associate with a bullet today. Oh, okay. And the genius of it was in at the bottom of this cone was a dimple, a bit like the bottom of a wine glass. And so what you do is when you load the weapon, you could get the round down really easily because it wasn't flush to the barrel. But when you shot the weapon, the energy from the explosion would go into that dimple and cause the ammunition to spread open, thus engaging the rifling on the way out. Right. So they could have the high rate of fire of three to four shots a minute, but with the accuracy of a rifle all of a sudden, and that was a huge leap forward in technology. Um, so that, that, was, that was a real big deal. Um, so along with the hammerlock now and the... Um, rifling we've got a firearm that is very safe to use it's very consistent um, and the rate of fire is pretty high and incredibly accurate um in fact you start to see sort of sniping become a actual sort of technique starting to be utilized by armies so the crimean war was a good example um the russians were using it um so as well as the british it's why as well um the more audacious uniforms of important officers and things start to get dumbed down a little bit to make them a little bit more rank and file because they didn't want to stand out because people could be like, I see you, you can't and <laughs> shoot you from a mile off. Yeah, we have these uh, <laughs> pretty good weapons now. We like, I think in off. the Crimea, mm. like, they, a lot of the officers actually took their jackets off um, to avoid being targeted in that manner. So, um, yeah, so it was a hugely forward, hugely forward in technology. Um, and, uh, yeah, and so the P-53 was... Combining all the things we talked about, rifling, hammerlocks, that and that was in a lot of 1853. So if, you, if your commanding officer is taking off his shit and putting it on you, like, oh, uh, God, yeah, yeah. You, you, <laughs> what are you doing? Oh, I just thought nothing, you'd look nice just, in that. Yeah, you look great, mate. I think those golden like epaulets really compliment your eyes. <laughs> <laughs> oh, he's dead. <laughs> <laughs> just go and stand at the front there. <laughs> Yeah, I think you should lead us yeah. today. Just yeah. for today. Just for today. Training. Yeah. <laughs> I see potential in you and I want to give you a test run. <laughs> oh, just... didn't pass the test. I'll have that back. <laughs> Passes it on to the next guy. Here you go. You try. Um... How many bullets have they got? <laughs> yeah, just counting the holes in the jacket. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, so... Um... <laughs> So yeah, so it's it's a big leap forward, and it changes how firearms get utilised in the future. Um, Crimean War. So when was that? What what year? Uh, So the P fifty three was created and put into standard issue in eighteen fifty three. Okay, so we're getting more fifty years from, you know, First World War, kind of. Yeah, yeah, we're getting closer to, and, and things start to rapidly change. Um, Because it's not long until we actually get rid of all the muzzle-loading weapons and replace it with uh, breech-loading weapons. And instead of using musket balls, we then start to use uh, what we would understand as a bullet today. Mm. So, And is a bullet... Is there any more, before we move on to bullets, mm. is there any other pertinent stuff we should know from the rifle loading or the end loading oh uh, no the p53 works just like any other musket in the sense that you have to put everything down the barrel, barrel and ram That's it down barrel loading. yeah That's the one. So, oh, i've been listening you've been listening <laughs> so yeah you've got to if they're barrel loading you've got to put uh, the gunpowder down the barrel the wadding all that sort of stuff and again they come in cartridges so they're easier to do much quicker to use um but yeah we do away with that and we start looking at breech loading weapons um now obviously uh, we are emitting quite a lot of other firearms and, and cutting edge stuff. Well, I'm yeah, but we're we're talking about like the 
we're talking about a, a very gen yeah main leaps and generalizations uh in in sort of like advancing through and i'm using the british rifles really as an examples of those in between these points and there are sort of offshoots like i said henry the eighth was playing around with rifling back in his day so there are exceptions to the rule um and there's loads of really weird and wonderful guns that again a bit like the wheel lock and the flintlock where people have tried to innovate and have unfortunately come up short but the ideas yeah, are really do, exciting yeah but they do that now like you've seen the guy that 3d printed his own weapon and like took it through airport security just to try and like it could only fire one, one bullet yeah before it like but have you seen like they've the development in that like they're, they're making more, they're you, making semi-automatics like and and automatic fight like you can free get 3D printing, fight. printing metals now. Yeah, like but back you know before it was you know plastic. Well, these still are polymer. Got, yeah, but they're still like rapid fires and stuff. That's, it's terrifying. That's, yeah, it's that's not, not good. Fun, is it? Um, but yeah, so um, obviously it's only the ammunition. You can't 3D print ammunition. You can't 3D print gunpowder. But no, but yeah, imagine you can hide a single bullet if you wanted to uh, going through. Not that we're saying you should. You know what? We'll, I don't know we'll, how we'll admit I, this. <laughs> yeah, I don't know how you would, but anyway. Um, but yeah, so after all that, we're now going to get to the Martini Henry, which was famously used during the very, very, uh, what should we call it? Controversial Zulu Wars, where we were over protecting our colonial uh, assets against native people not P great protecting or uh is that is that a polite way <laughs> do you, do it's you... a political way of putting it, <laughs> it, it pc way we're it. we're not going to yeah, go into the politics protecting our assets, of it today because i mean... genuinely don't think i am well informed enough about the conflict or equipped to deal with such hefty topics but uh you know it might come in the future um, talking about empire and that whole debacle. Um, but we'll stick with the guns and the development of the guns. And the Martini Henry was the first standard issue breech loading rifle for the British infantry. And it was the first one to use a bullet. So what is a bullet? Well, I don't know whether we should... Um, is, would this come into part two? Well, we could go into part two. We finished all the muzzle loaders. Well, um, I mean, it is getting on a bit. <clears throat> okay, do you know what? I've just teased you. Yeah. So now a little bit of bullet teasing. Now modern weapons are well, what you we know as we're going to go from the Martini Henry still, through the to thing the thing that that was in what 1850. Wait, when was so it? So this one was the Zulu Wars, which was a well, oh, fuck. What was it? it was eighteen? I think it was eighteen eighties or eighteen seventies. Uh. Let's have a ganders. It was, yeah. Oh God, it was even late. It was, it was, it was the year of eighteen seventy nine. So this is arguably modern day weaponry. <clears throat> pretty much, we're pretty much getting to it. Um, so yeah, we can leave it there, and we can pick up from it, pick it up from the next episode, and continue through to modern day stuff. Yeah, we'll do that. Because um, I think we're probably already on about an hour or 20. Yeah. Yeah, I'm happy to do that. I feel like we've done a pretty, well, you've done a pretty good overview of, you know. Yeah. The weaponry, the guns. Yeah, the and the guns. general, yeah, Gen the guns. General, yeah. general development Gen of the guns. The guns and stuff. The guns <laughs> are gone and done. They're talking about the gunnies. <laughs> oh, the <de> gunnies. <laughs> One minute. <coughs> He's dying. I've been shot in a chest with a rifle. Yeah. So okay, we'll we'll bring it to an end there, and uh, we will. No, that was good. Though. I enjoyed. I enjoyed that. Yeah. Hopefully. I, I um didn't think uh, they existed that long ago. You yeah. Just don't mad. know. No, you don't. Like they are primitive, though, compared to what you see now. But yeah. They would be, of course, they would be, but um, you don't think they were. That far, not long ago. It's just mad that, like, weapon technology, I've always thought, it's just so slow growing. Like, compared to other stuff, 
Well, this is the thing. It, it, but but they're still used today. Like it's still it's a primitive for like it's, they're so effective, and that's why they're still used. Yeah, obviously. and they but they're so primitive still. Yeah, because the mechanics of it are just. You know, the mechanics haven't changed. No, the mechanics haven't changed. The the bullets changed and the way of like firing's changed. But, you know, in terms of it's going down a fucking barrel. Yeah. And essentially the the science behind uh, the explosive force in a barrel. Yeah. But that's why, that's why, you know, today you've got so many improvised weapons which are made out of like, you can make a shotgun out of a bloody wheel lock. The steering wheel lock. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh. You just put. <laughs> I don't know if we want to. <laughs> no, exactly. Say how but to make a weapon. Exactly. I don't. Podcast. Yeah, probably not a good yeah. idea. Probably. But this you is what can I mean. Google it. The mechanics oh. of a firearm are very simple. It's the effect. It's the basically the ergonomics and the um, effectiveness. It's essentially yeah. It's, it, essentially, all we've done with guns is increased the rate of which we can cause that reaction and, and that process and yeah just modern technology yeah because that's the thing they, they wouldn't have had simi- like i, 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 I can imagine when up. you're making a gun now you'd have massive computer simulations of how that bullet would projectile out of the barrel and they could be able to tweak it and do all that kind of stuff and they'd have all the science there and the numbers in the yeah in the program to be able to tell you exactly what you want but also industrialization, mm. because when we get into the part two, you, oh, and you will, can make them more. Yeah, you, you are going to suddenly them. see a much faster development of innovations. So, so far, it's been pretty slow going. But from this point on, it gets rapid. But this is what I mean. It's like the technology for that. If you look at other areas of warfare, like, um, like I know we said we weren't going into artillery, but you look at that kind of stuff. Now we have like unmanned drones, which have like nuclear bombs attached to them, and you know that kind of caliber of weapon. I'm sorry, I can't comment on that because that's not <laughs> firearms. That's yeah, but do you know what I mean? Aircraft. You bring an air. I said no artillery. Now you bring an aircraft into but, this. But you absolute bastard. But com- compared to, I'm going to set some ground rules. <laughs> this is bullshit. Compared to, you know, you can't ambush me on topics I don't know about. Compared to rifles and handguns and all that sort of stuff. Oh yeah, absolutely. That, like. You know, the fact that now you can just, yeah, it's just completely different. Like, GPS-guided rockets and stuff. Yeah. Like, mad. It's mad. But we'll touch upon that a little bit more in the next episode when we're talking there about must that, be some but... new technology they're trying to use. Don't. It's terrifying. Is it? Do you know? Do you know much? I know. No, I don't know much. But I do know that essentially what we're doing is automating it. Because the biggest problem, PR wise, is that people get killed. You like the people that you're meant to like, so your soldiers and stuff. So it's they're moving towards trying to make things more safe for the soldiers, by which ultimately means removing them from the combat zone. Essentially, like nowadays, you only really put boots on ground where you need to hold it. Um, you, you know, you can use drones and airstrikes now to remove the target, but if you want to stop people from moving back into that area, you need boots on ground. Um, so it's just one of those things. It's it's mad. It's mad where it's going. I don't like it. No, it's scary. That's why we do history because we know history and <clears> history is safe. We ain't gonna. But yeah, but this is when you get to the repeating history side. People don't listen. I mean, I read an article that like a uh, uh, large scale conflict is possible in the next thirty years. Apparently, this is the problem I have with this. Though it's like, is it? Now? Everyone has. I think. I think nuclear weapons. By the time the first one's gone off, we'll all be dead. Yeah. Like. Yeah. I don't. Mm. Mm. But again, let's not talk. About what was it? It, it was. Uh, I don't know what weapons World War Three would be fought with, but I do know that World War Four would be fought with sticks and stones. That was was it? Was it not Einstein? That was Einstein. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, so we'll we'll, we'll separate this yeah, into two we'll, parts. We'll, we'll go part two. Yeah, modern. And we'll t- yeah, we'll pick up where we left off with the the Martini Henry and yeah, and talk about how things developed from that point on. Cool. Excellent. Well, well, that was fun, if not a bit harrowing and slightly scary. 
But we had fun on the way. It's just mad these people that developed all these things and tried different well, I don't know, it's just crazy, isn't it? Especially yeah. the technology they had. Like even if I was had the technical know how to be like, oh, I could develop this a little bit better, like keep increasing on, you know, the reliability, the rate of fire, all that sort of even if I knew and they'd had the technical know how. Would you really want to be playing around with fucking gunpowder and shit, knowing fully well that people are blowing their hands off and faces and all that sort of stuff? Not like a small amount of people. I can imagine it happened quite regularly where people just blew hands off, didn't store shit correctly. Mm -hmm. like, why would you want to play with that? Because I get it. War. Men just want to see the world burn. <laughs> <laughs> like, it doesn't make sense. Like, yeah, but do you remember your obsession with like firecrackers as kids? Like, I remember when people came back from France on like trips. France was a crazy place, and they shit. and they brought back some explosives things, and you were like, "That is the coolest thing, thing is, I've ever." You seen. could buy them from like street sellers. Yeah, because I remember it'd be like you can buy them at like 13, 14. Yeah, and we like we used to blow shit up with them. We used to go and blow like our friend had like some old Warhammer it's models, so and we used to just go and bad. blow them up in the forest. It's awful. Well, we have you had fun? Yeah. Um, we certainly did. Yeah. Yeah. It's uh It's Friday night. It's, it's Friday. Sunday. Yeah. <laughs> it's Sunday. It's Sunday. Um yeah, I guess we'll just we'll end it there and you can see you in part two. Yeah, hopefully if you liked it, there's part two coming. Obviously, like we said, talking more about the what we'd consider, I guess, modern, modern. Day weaponry. Yeah. Um I mean, it wouldn't be modern. It can't be modern because it's history. -ty. Yeah, but... But it will be nearly modern. Arguably, the modern era of weaponry. It's slowly... What we know as today as a, as, a, as a gun, I guess. Anyway, I've been David. <laughs> I've been Ali. And we're bringing this to an end. See you next time. See you in a bit. Boy. You can't see on the... Well, you can't hear through the airways. I'm actually pointing my fingers up in the air. He's like, dancing. Psh, psh, psh. Oh, no, no. He's doing cowboy shooting. Yeah. Psh, psh, psh. End of the episode. Excellent. There we go. Boom. <laughs> See you in a bit. Bye. Bye.